Brian Stanton here with ASEP Frontline, joined uh, by Dr. Colin Cade. He was one of our legacy interviews. He was part of the very first batch of interviews that we did um, on ASEP Frontline. And uh, so very early, still remembers in front of the press room. There, where was that conference? Where? Was it Boston? I think it was, uh, Is Boston? It might have been Boston. At least, at least two or three years ago. Oh, is it more than that? Because I've done this three. This is the third year here, so seventy six. That'd have been fifteen. Yeah, I think that's yeah, two thousand fifteen. Right. <coughs> and so one of the very first interviews that we did um, there. So glad to have him back today, Colin Cade, M D F A C E P F A A M E M. I think I put too many A's in there, but it's F A A E M. And what we're talking about today is um, something that we see some. But it's something we definitely don't want to miss. And actually, if you look at the boards um, and you look at the board reviews, especially Rosh and things like that, you would think this this is every third patient who comes in um, when it comes to the treatment of hemophilia A. Um, one of the bleeding disorders that's always focused on a fair amount in medical school. Uh, we see it in residency. We see some on the out. But it's one of those things we have to keep in our mind um, as we are treating our patients for the potential of badness to happen. You know, we always talk about you know, little old people who are on their um, factor 10A inhibitors who fall and come in the emergency department, uh, an automatic CT scan with that. Well, this is another one uh, where um, there's manda- almost mandatory evaluations and treatment uh, options that have to be done um, secondary to the potential risk. So, Dr. Cade, thanks for joining us again here on the front line. Thanks for having me. So, give us just background. Um, in case you're out there and you haven't reviewed hemophilia A recently, what's kind of the background of it, what causes it, and, um, and what are the risks that, that come along with it? Well, hemophilia, and in particular hemophilia A, is a, we'd like to think of it as an inherited coagulopathy, <clears throat> in which case you inherit a defective gene for the production of factor VIII, uh, hemophilia B, which is similar but much less common, is a defect in the gene that codes for factor IX. And we typically, as I said, we think of this as an inherited coagulopathy, as an X-linked recessive inherited coagulopathy. However, there are some unusual cases, and they always seem to show up on boards mm-hmm. for some yeah. reason, <clears throat> in which you actually develop a, an acquired inhibitor to one of the factors, and that's an antibody to the factor, and that happens in people who generally who have a higher likelihood of developing uh, antibodies uh, in general, like people who've had other um, sorts of um, uh, antibody-mediated diseases. Uh, but in, the most common thing that we're going to see in our departments is going to be the inherited coagulopathies. And you got the, it's one of those that's in the, the uh, coagulation tree uh, out there. And, you know, so clearly it's going to inhibit that, uh, progression through the uh, the clotting factors, um, of course, increasing that that risks of, of hemorrhage. So, what are the big risks? I mean, I mentioned bleeding; it's obvious. But um, what are the big risks that we're going to see with the uh, with the hemophilia, especially hemophilia A? It's going to be the patient who who has the disease, <clears throat> who is not necessarily uh, maybe the worst uh, case scenario where they have very very low factor levels. It might be the person who has an intermediate level of uh, factor deficiency who does not normally experience bleeds but comes in as a trauma patient Mm -hmm. after a significant injury, a significant fall, and we don't necessarily suspect that this patient is going to have as much of a problem as they can have. When they're deficient in that clotting factor, they have a tendency to have occult bleeds, they have a tendency to have delayed bleeds. And sometimes we can think of this patient as almost in the same way as we do a warfarin patient who has Mm -hmm. had a fall, because not necessarily on the first time we see them, they might develop their their problem. In other words, they can bleed out to 72 hours. Now, there's a spectrum of severity. People can have a very mild disorder in which they have pretty good functioning of their clotting cascade, and they do okay most of the time. And then there are these moderate patients who have a, a, a substantially lower level than baseline, and they might not be the ones who think of themselves as uh, potentially uh, serious bleeders. The ones who do have very, very low clotting levels, they are usually very self-aware, and they're the ones who are going to come in with their factor products, and they're going to know more about the disease than we are. 
and they're going to tell us, I, need, I, I had this injury, I need to be uh, given X amount of uh, clotting factor. Mm -hmm. So when, it, when it's easy, it's easy. When it's occult and when it's a little bit less of a severe disease process, it can sneak up on you, and you, you kind of have to be aware that those patients can present a very significant risk. How often are we going to see this in folks that don't know that they have it? I mean, that don't know they've got a, a bleeding disorder or anything like that. How often is that going to be something that potentially <coughs> presents to us? The, the time when that's going to happen is going to be mostly in women because a woman who is a carrier, typically if a, a, women can have the full-blown uh, homozygous disease process, but it's unusual. It would have to occur if a hemophiliac male uh, creates an offspring with a carrier, and then one of the females can actually be uh, XX, in which both chromosomes are uh, contain the defect. But more often than not, when you're going to see the occult bleeding is going to be in a female who's a carrier. And under normal circumstances, every woman inactivates one or the other of her X chromosomes. Mm -hmm. That's a normal thing called lionization. If somebody is uh, asymmetrically mosaicized, in other words, they, by chance alone, inactivate enough of the good chromosome and have the bad, enough of the bad chromosome available, they can actually be a pretty significant bleed risk. We typically see that, in, 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 and we get some hints to that in a woman who comes in and says, instead of a normal three or four day period, I bleed for eight or nine days and I bleed a huge mm -hmm. amount, and they come in with baseline hemoglobins that are low. Those patients are at risk to have significant clotting problems, especially in, in the setting of trauma. That's interesting, you know, because it's a lot of times, I, the ones I've experienced have been folks that come in that say, I know I've got this, I know this is going on. You're, you're absolutely correct on the more severe cases, bringing in uh, the factors and the plan uh, with them. Of course, if you're looking at the board review and the boards, it's always uh, somebody who's either had a tooth extracted that won't stop bleeding, or of course the trauma patient and trying to get you to lead you on to make sure that you get the factors and treatment started before uh, such as a CT scan of the head or something like that to make sure the treatments come first. Um, so, you know, those are the things to kind of think about. It's a review. You got the hemophilia A with the factor 8, hemophilia, nine, uh, hemophilia B with the factor 9, sometimes a Christmas disease um, that you're always going to see it that you were taught in medical school. How are we able to, when we, we have somebody like this come in the emergency department, first of all, what kind of you mentioned the, the females who are going to come in potentially with yes. longer courses of their <coughs> menstrual cycles. Uh, but with other folks, what are the things that are going to tip us off if it's not something that's presented to us up front? Well, typically the pattern of bleeding that you see in hemophiliacs is a little different than you see in somebody who's on a, an anticoagulant or who has a platelet problem. People who have platelet disorders tend to bleed superficially. They tend to have uh, capillary bleeding. You're going to see mucosal bleeding from the nose. Uh, sometimes in the GI tract, but usually not in, in, in severe cases. Uh, these are the, the little bit more minor bleeding, the, per, the person who presents with petechia and purpura. The person who has a hemophilia has a weird pattern of bleeding in which they get intramuscular and, and intrajoint bleeding. Mm. And those are, the, those are the ones who are, it, that's kind of a big tip off that there's something wrong here. These big lumpy hematomas that we don't expect to see, even in patients who are on uh, various types of uh, coagulation factor inhibitors, warfarin, anti-10 drugs, anti-2 drugs. And they're going to have a pattern of bleeding that sometimes is spontaneous, frequently provoked by trauma. And if you go back and you take a history, which I know we don't, we, you know, we don't do that anymore. We, we, we walk in the room, we take a look at the patient, we assess the problem immediately. But you go, if you go back and you start to ask, are there other family members, are there other people who have had bleeding disorders? And if the answer is yes, you have to take this unusual situation and consider the possibility that this could be an inherited coagulopathy. And that being said, when I do the evaluation, what kind of lab abnormalities work up am I going to need to do from a lab standpoint? A lot of stuff that you're going to do from the emergency department, it, uh, you might be sending some unusual tests. You might be sending factor levels and things like that, but those are not going to come back to you in real time. What might be helpful to you is to get a PTT. And if the PTT in a patient is abnormal, there's only a few reasons for that. The first, the biggest reason is it's a lab error. Mm -hmm. Someone drew it in a heparinized tube. Second reason is contamination of some sort with heparin, uh, not just maybe in the tube, but in the lab process itself. But then if you repeat that and you see the PTT is significantly elevated, there aren't all that many disease processes that do that. You can see that in hemophilia, 
And you can also see that in patients who have severe von Willebrand's disease, because von Willebrand's factor not only attaches platelets to endothelium, it carries factor VIII in the blood. So a significant deficiency will also manifest uh, with an abnormal uh, factor VIII level, translating into an abnormal PTT. And by the way, that is a that has been on every test preparation and almost every test I've ever taken. Someone comes in with a prolonged bleeding time and an abnormal PTT. That's von Willebrand's. And, and if the bleeding time is normal and the PTT is abnormal for no explainable reason, I have to consider the possibility that this is an occult uh, hemophilia or maybe even an acquired hemophilia. One of the big things, and actually tested quite often, is you know this this presentation of somebody who comes in with potential uh, potential signs of abuse. I mean, this can a lot of the bleeding disorders can be confused for sign for signs of abuse. Um, how do we how can we distinguish between that abuse and the, the, un, and the undiagnosed hemophiliac? I think based on the number game alone, if you defaulted to say this could be an abuse patient and I'm going to default and err on the side of saying I'm going to at least ask the right questions and mm -hmm. get social work involved and make sure that I'm taking the right history, separate the parent or in some cases an older, an older person with a caregiver, separate them out and ask the right questions up front but in the back of your mind, you should really consider the possibility, like if the family says, he bruises like this all the time, I just grab his arm to pull him, he was trying to cross the street, I grabbed his arm, and now he's got these big bruises. You at least have to consider the possibility that this could be a hemophilia, because you're gonna, you might be the only one who's going to do that. If, if in doubt, work toward the safety of that child or safety of that adult, and then you can always send that patient for further testing on down the line. If they've made it that far, and all they're coming in for is bruising, they're going to be able to wait out the hemophilia workup, mm -hmm. but they might not be able to wait out the abuse situation. So we're on the front line. It's our responsibility to at least consider it. Yeah, it's, and of course, in training, we're always hearing about the osteogenesis imperfecta kid uh, that comes in with signs, you know, concerning for abuse, come to find out the osteogenesis imperfecta, but hemophilia is, is there as well. Earlier you mentioned um, some of the acquired hemophilia versus uh, congenital hemophilia. I mean, do those two, are we going to see them, they're, they're going to present significantly differently? And, or, or how do we, is there a way to kind of tip off the, the, the difference? Well, this is going to be usually the older adult who's going to come in and they have inappropriate bleeding and in patterns that, that, are, that are really making you scratch your head. Somebody who comes in after a very minor injury who has bleeding in, you know, all over their chest and arms they have a significant drop in hemoglobin, and they were previously healthy. And in this patient, it's, it's, this, because this is such a rare thing, you're going to have to have a very high index, index of suspicion in order to be able to pull this one out. Mm -hmm. But if you find somebody who has very inappropriate bleeding without a good explanation, and you check a PTT and it's way off the charts, you have to stop and say, could this person have an inhibitor? And that is a spontaneous antibody to one of the factors. And it, 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 it's unusual, but if you make that diagnosis, you are, going to, you are going to be the rock star of the internal medicine department at your hospital because they're going to really be impressed that you actually came up with that. It's unusual, but it is one of the causes of abnormal PTT that is unexplained. All right. The, um, let's talk about some of the management. You know, as emergency physicians, it's good to know about <clears throat> the disease process, but really for us it's more important as to what the heck do I do with it when it shows up. What are the evaluation considerations and management considerations for a hemophilia patient who comes into the emergency department? Okay, let's say I've got somebody who comes in who's a known hemophiliac. That person, first of all, is probably going to know more about their own disease than you are and, and, and than I am, and they will oftentimes come in with uh, some paperwork or the name of a hematologist who will say, uh, and the patient might say, I have another bleed, I don't have my factor with me, this is how much I get. Mm -hmm. So if this person, let's say they have a joint bleed, we don't tend to think of that as much of a, as an emergency as somebody who's got an intracranial hemorrhage, but for that patient, even a single joint bleed can lead to joint destruction. And most of these guys have a target joint that will bleed over and over again. So when we're looking at this patient, we need to assess the severity of the bleed and that the severity of the bleed triggers us into understanding how much factor do we have to give them. And there are formulas for this. Let's say this person is a, has a severe bleed, like a, uh, a spleen laceration or a liver lack or an intracranial hemorrhage. Mm 
I want to correct them to 100% of their normal factor activity. And I might have the, the, the uh, resources to know what their factor levels run normally, but when in doubt, it's never problematic to give a little bit too much factor. It's problematic to not give enough and not give enough in time. So if I assume that their factor level is zero in this unconscious person with a hematoma in their brain, I'm going to have to correct them to 100%. In order to do that, I'm going to use 50 units per kilo of the factor eight replacement. If it's a factor nine disease, I use 100 units per kilo. Mm -hmm. And so whatever the percentage I want to correct to, if, and, and let's say factor eight is so much more common than, than factor nine deficiency, so we, we focus on that one. Whatever percentage I want to get to, it's half that number in units per kilo of factor to replace. And it's also probably the patient, if the patient's awake, they will know. If they, if they go to a particular hospital system, you can talk to their, the pharmacist in that hospital system. You can get in touch with their hematologist. But let's say it's just you. There are, there are calculations. And if you don't remember it, you can, go on, you can go on to any hemophilia website, to any of our online resources, and they will tell you how to do this calculation. And, and this is very important for, the, for these patients. Now, <clears throat> some of these patients who have been taking factor for a long time will have an inhibitor that mm -hmm. they spontaneously generate to the factor because I'm giving them replacement. So if someone comes in and they say, I have hemophilia A with an inhibitor, that means that I've been giving them, we've been giving them so much factor for so long, it doesn't even take that long in some cases, that they have developed an antibody to the factor that we're giving them. And in that case, I have to bypass that factor, and I have to understand if someone says inhibitor, that means to me I've got to give something different. And the something different is either going to be something called FIBA, factor mm -hmm. eight inhibitor bypassing activity. You know this. You just don't know you know it, but you know it as PCC, prothrombin complex concentrate, in which we activate some of those factors. So activated PCC is FIBA. The other possibility that I can give this patient is factor seven, uh, and everyone remembers that from a few years ago when there was this big idea, what we give factor seven for generalized bleeding. Well, it's approved actually for real in patients who have hemophilia, and it triggers the other side of the cascade that does not involve factors eight and nine, and that causes a big thrombin burst and can really mitigate the bleeding that they have. These are very expensive treatments, but when you have an antibody to the normal treatment, you have to go above and beyond and either use a bypassing agent or trigger the opposite side of the cascade. That's important to know because I don't know that that's really educated that often. I mean, I don't recall <clears throat> it, the education in that from medical school and from residency with the, with the inhibitor side of that. We assume, you know, hemophilia A gets eight, hemophilia B gets nine. There you go. And, and that's, exactly, that's exactly the case. Now, interestingly, there's a new drug that's been out for uh, maybe a little more than a year. It's something called Heme Libra, and what it is is it's an antibody that instead of the antibody doing something bad to us, the antibody actually acts on factor 10 to turn factor 10 on and activate it. Mm -hmm. So there are people who have known inhibitors that will take this particular drug on a regular basis and instead of their factor, and what that does is that bypasses the entire system and simply flips the switch to turning factor 10 into an active factor. And this probably, we don't know for sure, this probably will change the course of some of these patients who have inhibitors. And the, it may eventually get expanded to being used just in regular hemophiliacs without inhibitors too. So it's something that you, if you hear that name, Heme Libra, or you hear somebody say, there's a monoclonal antibody that I'm taking that triggers my factors to work because I have an inhibitor, that should clue you in right there. As soon as you hear that, you have to say, I'm gonna to have to also, in an acute bleeding episode, give them a bypassing agent because that drug alone is not enough to solve their bleeding problems if they have that. But that should, as soon as you hear that they're on that kind of a drug, your brain should go, they have an inhibitor, I need to add something else like FIBA or, mm -hmm. or factor seven in order to mitigate the bleeding. And if you're doing the test, the question's gonna come up about the course. I mean, it's just like the antibiotics for sepsis, you know, every, antibiotics first before everything else. When it comes to uh, meningitis and, and babies, antibiotics before anything else in this case, with a trauma evaluation or, or somebody comes in with bleeding associated with hemophilia, um, it's very strongly pushed to get those medications on board, ordered and on board before. Well, don't delay the factor replacement uh, for any type of evaluation. That is absolutely true. And, and 
unlike what we unlike what we're taught in a lot of our courses or in a lot of our tests, we are not serial thinkers. We are parallel thinkers. Right. So while I'm ordering the CT te- the CT head and CT abdomen on my potential trauma patient, I'm also calling pharmacy and saying I need factor down here. And if you if you don't know, you have resources. Ask the patient. Ask the patient's family. Talk to your pharmacy. Call your hematologist. Call their hematologist. Look it up online. Order the factor and get that factor in. Because regardless of whether they have something on CT, they have, they have the trauma, and we know that they get delayed bleeds, and we know that getting that factor in early is the difference between life and death in some of these patients. Well, then I think the key there is advising, ensuring that the patient's primary nurse, because what I see a lot is that um, the treatments will be delayed in order to try to streamline the evaluation, get the scans, get the imaging, Get all that stuff and don't want to start medications because don't want to have to stop it and start it or move it or whatnot but ensuring making sure that your staff knows that the factor replacement is a high priority and needs to be done as soon as it's available it needs to be initiated as soon as it's available these are one of the these are one of the few types of cases that like i have residents i don't always i go in the room i see the patient i don't always stand there by the bedside myself mm-hmm. but this is the one where i'll teach the residents and myself I will stand by the bedside and I will point to the nurse and I'll say, I need you to do this, I need you to do this, and I need you to do this. Much like my flash pulmonary edema patient who I'm directing the sublingual nitro, the nitro boluses, the nitro nitro drips, the BiPAP, all that stuff is happening for me in real time. The same thing here. I'm saying you need to get this, you need to get this, and you need to get this, and I'm actually taking control of that situation because if I don't, there's a risk of of, of these things falling through the cracks, and that never goes well for the patient. You mentioned just a few minutes ago contacting the hematologist, your hematology, the patient's hematologist. Um, what is the role and how do we kind of work that in here in terms of what I manage in the emergency department versus the potential uh, of admission versus actually transfer or admission to a, a more specialized hemophilia type center? If, if, I have the, if the type of bleeding that I'm dealing with is something that's more on the routine side, like the kid who falls and lands on his knee, and he, now he's got, a, he's got a joint bleed. That's the patient that I'm going to probably, if I have the resources available in my hospital, I'm going to initiate the, uh, the treatment in contact with the hematologist. And this may, may very well be um, a patient who I will watch for a period of time, and I'll send home, and the, ch- the change will be, I want you to increase your fa- the amount of factor you're giving yourself for X number of days. And they don't necessarily need to be seen by the other hematologist in real time. The person who has the more serious injury, the more complex problem, or the person with the inhibitor who, who is, who is uh, bleeding and dropping their hemoglobin, and I don't have the resources available to fix that, that's the one I'm going to transfer. If I have the capability of giving the right agents in my, in my setting, I will do that prior to transfer because that's important. If I don't have those things available, my responsibility is to get that patient to somebody who does have the factors available in, in the most expedited period of time. And, in, and again, in conjunction with somebody else at the receiving facility who knows what the plan is and who knows how to handle this. Not every hematologist you call will understand this process because some of them deal with, you know, I, I deal with APL. That's all I do. Mm-hmm. I deal with uh, a, a, a acute leukemias or I deal with sickle cell disease. I don't deal with this particular problem. You've got to find the right people, and it's our responsibility, and we're good at this, at, at annoying the right people to get the person who's going to make the most difference for us. It's a time-sensitive diagnosis. It's not a sexy disease by any stretch of the imagination. It's a nerd disease. It's a nerd disease. It's yeah. not a sexy disease, but it's one of those that's a time-sensitive disease process when it comes into the emergency department. It's one of those that we need to be on top of and not just uh, – and not just – sitting on or letting it sit out in the lobby for six hours while we're waiting to get a, a bed available. Any closing points or thoughts, uh, Dr. Cade, before we wrap up? Let's just say that this is a zebra disease, but this zebra has fangs, and, it, and, and it's, a, it, it's a hunter killer. It's not, it's not that tame zebra that you can miss. It's the real one. How can folks get more information from you, contact you if they have any questions or, uh, or need, want to uh, refresh themselves on the uh, hemophilias? They can contact me personally at colin.cade, K-A-I-D-E, at OSU, Ohio State University, mcmedicalcenter.edu, and they can contact the local hemophilia organization. Well, it's fantastic because we live two and a half hours apart from each other, and yet we're We've always interviewed either in Boston, at some coastal, near coastal area now in uh, 
San Diego here, we, we honestly could just take a day trip and see each other and get these things knocked out. Absolutely. All right. For, as for me, you can uh, contact me if you have any questions. Your everyday medicine at gmail.com. For, of course, if you ask me about hemophilia, I'm just going to send it right to Dr. Kate. But uh, your Fair everyday enough. medicine. Your everyday medicine at gmail.com. As for Twitter, at Everyday Med. Um, follow along and uh, appreciate you uh, tuning in. And Dr. Kate, thank you. Thank you for having me. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.